Madam A or Mr. G? And do you need your own digital privacy officer? Hi, I'm Tanya Hall for ZDNet, and joining me is Stacey Higginbotham. She is the host of the Internet of Things podcast, which is found at StaceyOnIoT.com. Welcome, Stacey. Hi, thank you, Tanya. So you, um, you have a background in Internet of Things as well as all things technology, and you have a site, Stacey on IoT, as I mentioned. What, is, what do you do there? I do a podcast, a newsletter, and write stories all about the Internet of Things. It's a big topic. <laughs> it's a huge topic, and it's getting bigger and bigger. And it was also a very big topic at CES, which you just returned from. And uh, you, you escaped the, the, the CES flu, which congratulations on that. I was very excited not to get sick for the week after CES. But you've had a lot of interesting developments in that what you found at CES, including uh, what you think of the next uh, level of Internet of Things. Talk, talk a little bit about what your biggest takeaway was from CES. Sure. So everybody was talking about voice. It was the most exciting part of CES. But I found myself, maybe because I've had voice in my house for like three years, I found myself thinking, this is good from a user interface perspective but it's terrible still from an actually making your home smart perspective. So I'm starting to look now for companies that are actually making it easier to automate things. So instead of telling, I call her Madam A on our show because I don't want to set off anyone's echo, but instead of telling your echo or Google home, turn on living room lights, the living room lights actually turn on when you enter and they turn on at a setting that's appropriate for the time of day and what you'd like to be doing. So that's where I think we're going. And you're, I've heard you say that you're personally switching from what you, Madam A to, to, to home. Why is that? Partially because I have to, you know, is it my, eat my own dog food? It's not my dog food, but I have to eat all the dog food, everyone's dog food. So I can tell people how it, how it works, but mostly it's because Madam A is really terrible at answering questions that I ask a lot. So I'm constantly like, hey, can you put mangoes in the fridge? And Madame A is like, uh, a mango is a fruit. And Google actually can tell you those kind of things. Or, you know, what's the market cap of this particular stock yesterday? So Google's a little easier to talk to, but there's a lot of hitches there. And you said, I've also heard you say that we're really moving away from the focus on UI, voice essentially, to just being smarter. Um, what do you see happening uh, in the future of Internet of Things? So I think context is going to start mattering more than it does today. And I think what's really interesting there is things like location in the home. So that might be via Bluetooth. It might be using something like Aura, the the Wi-Fi reader thing, it could be using computer vision to say, Stacy right now is in the kitchen. She's with her daughter and it's five o'clock. What kind of things usually happen then? She usually turns the lights on because she's going to cook. So those kind of things should start happening automatically in my home as opposed to me ordering Madam A to do it. The other thing is neither Google nor Madam A is really good at letting you chain together a lot of Things. So I use a program called You Know Me, and I've used a program called Stringify to basically create scenes, big settings. I don't know what to call it. So like I have a yoga setting. When I tell either of my devices to do yoga, my blinds come down to make it dim. My lights come on in a very dim setting. And my Amazon, Amazon television comes on because the video I do yoga to is on Amazon. So all of that happens just with one command. And that's the kind of stuff that we need to start thinking about making easier for consumers. And you've, I've heard you say that you have a preference of the two. In fact, one of them is a little more complicated to use than the other. Talk about your favorite and why you like that. For smart home, it is definitely Madam A. It's, she's, she's much better. She's easier to use. She has more devices. And, so, and she's so much better at music. Oh my gosh, I don't understand why Google cannot get music right. You ask Google to play anything for you, and sh I swear, half the time I get karaoke, the other half the time I get weird cover bands. I don't even know what they are. So, but again, Google's better at answering questions. So like in my life, I'm sitting here right now, I'm trying to go all Google and my family is hating me because we're, we're struggling to get things turned on. Last night we asked 
Google to turn on the Harmony, so our TV turned on, and then the Harmony voice comes in, and she's like, I've turned your TV on. And then my daughter was like, wait, was that, was that Alexa? What's happening? <laughs> so there's like a lot of confusion happening here. So I guess I didn't tell you my favorite. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my favorite is Google for answering questions and Madam A for managing my home. And I think that's the dilemma that we're in right now is there's really no perfect solution and, and, and uh, uh, Internet of Things is trying to get there. But there's a lot of excitement coming forward. But then those things collect data, right? So let's, that moves me to the next topic of GDPR um, and what we need to know about that moving forward and, and what businesses need to know and to be prepared. What is GDPR? Oh, it is a mess. Um, the EU put in the general data, I always screw up the acronym, general data protection regulations. So these were enacted and they go into effect on May 25th of this year. So you're going to see a lot more about it in the first part of this year. And basically what it is, is it protects the privacy of European Union citizens. So if you collect data on those citizens anywhere, you need to protect it. And there's a couple rules that you have to follow. But the biggest, and most of them are like right to be forgotten type rules. A lot of them are very basic rules. But the challenge and the big scary part about this is if you mess up, it costs you a lot of money. So when you, when you are found in non-compliance, it can cost you up to 4% of your annual revenue or $20 million, or actually 20 million euros which is a lot of money. So people are taking this very seriously. And I think what we're gonna see is after this goes into effect, we're gonna see a lot of citizens of the EU start to file lawsuits against companies around their data. And I think we're also actually gonna see, as you're a journalist, this is cool because you can actually start pulling your data from these companies to find out what they know about you. And I think there'll be some really interesting stories written on that that will influence consumers and what they buy. It's exciting and scary, and I think especially scary for businesses who run a very lean IT department but are in the tech business. And you, you can't, this isn't a responsibility, I think, that you can just push on your, your, your IT guy. You really probably need to think about somebody that specializes in this. I think this is going to be uh, a big concern, especially for smaller shops. Um, do companies need to hire a, a digital privacy officer? Well, so they actually talk about this in the regulations and they say that you don't, or sorry, they say you should have one if you're a public authority, so companies, this does not apply to you, organizations that engage in large, large scale systemic monitoring or organizations that engage in large scale processing of sensitive personal data. But those terms aren't actually defined very well. So, you know, if you're Google, do you have large-scale personal data? I would say yes. You know all of my searches. Um, if you're a connected lock maker, is your the fact that you've locked your door is that personal? I don't know. So those are those kind of companies have to hire a data protection officer. Everybody else can hire somebody like a consulting firm to come in and say, "Hey, GDPR, we'll fix it for you." Well, and I think that is going to open up a whole new line of business of people that are trying to help you understand and protect uh, protect you and potentially be from being sued by somebody across the pond. So are IT shops going to start questioning their Internet of Things strategy? Um, so not necessarily just as a result of GDPR, because that's, that's a whole other ballgame. But I think in the last probably three years, we've seen a lot of companies do these pilot IT projects. Um, if you're a retail store, maybe you're putting thermometers in your refrigerator cases and remotely monitoring them to make sure the, the, freezer, the freezer case doesn't go above a certain temperature and all the ice cream melts because that's terrible. Um, so those things have been happening for the last couple of years, but I think the ROI on those, not all of the ROIs are coming back like in a way that is productive for companies. And so I think they're really reconsidering how they do this. And they're also being faced with huge security risks. So now they're like, oh my God, I don't, I don't actually know if I want to connect all of my grocery store fridges. That could be terrible. Um, what if PETA gets mad at me stocking steaks and hacks my system? So those kind of things are going to force them to reassess what they're doing, how they're doing it, and how they value it. So I think... I think we'll see a lot of retrenchment and then 
a lot of kind of justification efforts to justify the costs, not just in dollar terms, but in like IT staff time and security risks. Well, on behalf of everybody on the internet, I want to thank you for staying on top of these topics so that we know what's going on and uh, we can listen to your podcast and follow your website. If somebody wants to connect with you, Stacey, if they will have more questions about whether it's GDPR or whatever, Internet of Things, how can they do that? They can find me at they can find me at GigaStacey, G-I-G-A-S-T-A-C-E-Y on Twitter or just go to my website and click contact and that's www.stacyoniot.com. I highly recommend that you do that and follow her on Twitter. Also check her out, uh, check her website out because she's got her podcast and everything she writes on there. And uh, you can also catch her on Twits uh, this weekend, Google, super smart lady. You can also follow me. Yep, you can follow me right here on my interviews on ZDNet or Tech Republic or find me on Twitter at, at Tanya Hall Radio or find me on Facebook by searching for The Tanya Hall Show. Until next time.